Welcome back friends. Today I drove a little over three hours one way through the rain, uh, through a bunch of road construction and a bunch of roads where I think I only went like 20 miles uh, per road out to the middle of nowhere. This is the most northeast I've ever been in my home state of Wisconsin to interview an Olympian for the first time pretty stoked about this i didn't discover him until fairly recently because cross-country skiing isn't exactly like the front of the media but we'll get to talk about it a little bit welcome to the show olympian cross-country skier kevin bulger hey thanks for having me thanks for making the drive dude this is a really nice house i know it's not yours but like this is a sweet house i can pretend it's mine yeah yeah <laughs> well you didn't grow up in this house right because this we're in uh was it lac du flambeau Flambeau? Back to Flambeau, yep. Yeah, but you, uh, where is Minocqua from here? Because you're from Minocqua? It's like 15 miles. Oh, that's close. Back. Yes, yeah, so but you didn't even drive through it. It's not that far from here at all. Mm. Um, so, yeah. When it's, did your parents get this house? We built this house. They oh, must you have, built it? Yeah. We had a cabin here before. Oh, cool. Um, so we tore it was it that Olympic money that was like, <laughs> we're I, gonna build I funded this. my parents to build this house. <laughs> it was cool. their, their, their investment into my career, you know, yeah. came back. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah <laughs> when exactly. did you guys build this? I don't know, actually. It must have been, oh, man, 2017-ish? Okay, and that was after you went to Norway. Yeah, well, I've, been, I've spent tons of time over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, like, yeah, it's still fairly new. Cool. I yeah, mean, it no, still feels like a new house. Yeah, this is a beautiful house right on the lake. I have a cabin um, up north, which is probably, I think we were talking off mic, maybe an hour uh, to the west of here, up kind of by cable. But this area of the state, like... I think that Wisconsin's um, forests and lakes are the most underrated part of this state, but like one of the more underrated parts of our country. Like everyone talks about, I heard you talk about another show about like Moab and the Red Rocks and stuff in Utah, which is dope because it looks like Mars. Like it's like a yeah. different, whole different world there than anywhere else in the world, really. But like everyone thinks of forests and they think of like Washington, but this is just as pretty. It's really like the same thing. We have over 15,000 lakes in Wisconsin and it's dope. And uh, that's what makes it so great for cross-country skiing, right? It definitely helps. Yeah. It so you started helps. cross-country skiing young, uh, third grade, I think, yep. right? Yep. And it was, they must have a bunch of trails around here, I guess. Yeah. Not too far, actually. There's a Monaco Winter Park. Oh, okay. Uh, it's like, it's, uh, they got to have like 80K of skiing. Oh, really? Yeah. It's all in a land trust. So it's like protected forever. Yeah. Um, okay. It's awesome. And they have great topography. So there's actually some like elevation out there, which is pretty sweet for the flat Midwest. But yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, it's not, and it's not that flat up in Northern Wisconsin. That's no? the other thing, right? Everyone thinks of like farmland and that's like Southern Wisconsin, but Northern Wisconsin and not even all of Southern Wisconsin, but Northern Wisconsin is like all forest and it's really not that flat. You know, like my city, Eau Claire, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's on the confluence of two rivers. It's not a flat city at all. Yeah. Like there's a ton of hills and stuff there. It's really gorgeous. And we yeah, have a ton of hiking and... trails and stuff there too. Um, did they do races? And, well, where's the Berkey from here? The Berkebiner is like the biggest race in this part of the country, right? Yeah. That, that that's in here? Cable where, yeah. where you're just saying you have your cabin. Yeah. So it's only like an hour 15. Okay. Kind of west from here. Northwestish. Sure. West-ish. Yeah. 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 Um, so I would assume that has some kind of influence over the reason there's so many trails out this way too, right? Like the, the whole community that's involved with that are the ones who volunteer and put together a lot of the trail system, I would guess. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it definitely helps having like the largest race in North America right. in our backyard. Sure. So I think that helps kind of fuel the fire to have all these new places and Winter Park like just pump money into it and like keep it awesome did you and your family ever go up and watch any of the berkey or anything my dad skied it a few times oh um, cool my brother skied it my dad actually signed up for it again this coming year it's um, in a new location though right or they changed it slightly last year it was changed just because of the low snow year we had oh okay yeah. so it was all in cable hmm. and usually it goes from cable to hayward um yeah. so but hopefully this next winter it'll be the original berkey and yeah do it as it's meant to be but so it's hard to compete with what you're getting there because you're still you're still kind of young, right? How old are you? Thirty one. I guess in the grand scheme of cross country skiing professionally, what is like the tail end of a career? Are you towards the tail end? Like, what's the age group? Yeah, like if you asked that question ten years ago, someone would have said like skiers peak from twenty eight to thirty five. Okay. So some would say maybe I'm in the prime of my career. Yeah. But now we're starting to see these like outliers who are like 18, 19, 20, 21, just like throwing down and are super fast. Yeah. Which is rare. Sure. Um, so now there's kind of like this long, big spectrum sure. of what age you can be and like still pump out good results. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's different, right? Because for a race, it's not like just top five. Like how many people are in a race? When I was listening to other interviews, you were talking about being top 20 is good. 
You know yeah. what I mean? But versus other sports, top 20 would not be good. So yeah. how many people are in like a race for like the World Cup as an example, where if a top 20 result would be good, how many people are in that race? There's like 80. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah there's a lot of people yeah. then. Yeah, for sure. And cool. then it can even go up into like the 100, like 110, 120-ish, mm -hmm. but not sure. much more than that. Sure. Um, but generally like on the World Cup, top 30 gives you World Cup points. Okay. And those are what you're kind of seeking. And that okay. gives you kind of your world ranking at the end of the year. Gotcha. Yeah. And we'll get more into that because that's, I don't think the vast majority of people have any understanding of it. Because like for somebody like me, even it's like, okay, well, there's the Olympics, but that's once every four years. But like, what else? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. well, I'm not aware of what the full circuit is. Obviously, there's going to be races and stuff, but I have no idea the depth of it because there's no media coverage really to it. Yeah. But I think that's part of it when you're talking about how now there's finally younger people that are like bursting on the scene. I got to imagine part of it is because we're not training kids at a young age to take it seriously. Like you didn't take it seriously till high school, right? Yeah, theoretically. I mean, I wasn't full on committed until like maybe junior year of high school. Right. Which and for a lot of sports, that would be way too late. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. I mean, you see basketball, football, soccer, kids are committing like full time to sports like that early, like yeah. super early. Yeah. We had a kid who was 6'11". Who dwarfs you at your what six three six four or something? I round up to six four. <laughs> there you go. I round up to six one. I'm like six foot and a half. <laughs> That's what my driver's license says. Uh, but he was six eleven when he was a freshman, and so he like his family moved to be in Eau Claire for him to go to our high school yeah. because we were D one for basketball. And even then, he only ended up playing for the Badgers, I think. And I don't even know that he was a starter necessarily. I guess yeah. I don't remember. Um, but that's how like seriously they take it, which is part of the difference between North America versus. Scandinavia, right? When it comes to the sport that you're in, you're yeah. an outlier. I feel like it's got to be, you're starting. I don't want to say that you're not starting from any kind of privilege because we're white males and like your parents obviously must have made a decent living and like had the opportunity for you to do those things, but you were still in the wrong area to be yeah. able to compete with like top tier athletes in that sport until at least what college? Yeah, roughly. I mean, I even took two years off after high school yeah, okay. just to ski. Sure. Because then, then I kind of knew like I was going to take skiing somewhere. Like I was committed. Yeah. Um, like, so I took two years off. To like you knew really... you were going to be pro or at least like that was for sure what you're going to try to do. Yeah, exactly. Like okay. I, I, like I made, I still remember a race I was at in Wausau. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going all in. Some sure. of these people might not be committed, but I'm going in. It's like, yeah. I'm doing this. Um, so that was like the time when like starting to figure out what I wanted to do with and it. And you were like a senior in high school. Roughly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then you went to Utah, I guess. Even then, you can't ski year round, right? Like no. cross country skiing, anyways, you can't. No, no, no. We have uh, these funny little things called roller skis. I've, I've seen people in Eau Claire once in a great while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where they they look like scooters, like they're long like that with just like one wheel on each end or yep. something, right? Yeah, they're pretty long. Yeah. Wheels on each end. Um, they have a ski binding on them. Okay. So we can use our ski boots that we use in the winter. Yeah. Um, and then we use our poles. We get special tips for the poles so they stick into the asphalt. Yeah, sure. Um, but then, yeah, we go ski and It feels kind of similar. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, like skating, you know, when you skate ski, which is, I would say, is like rollerblading. Yeah, sure. Um, that's, you know, that's pretty spot on. Yeah, okay. But when you classic ski, which is diagonal, mm. um, in winter, you have kick wax on your ski. And that's okay. what grabs the snow and you're allowed to go forward. Mm. So on roller skis, there's a ratchet weird um so they don't go backwards they only roll forwards has the technology of those developed a lot even just in your lifetime i gotta think that's like kind of a new thing they'll be working on a little bit but not not a crazy amount they've tried new things and making them on a carbon and like making them super fast and light and, yeah sure but just like a simple aluminum ski with the wheel like yeah not much has changed actually sure but a lot has changed with your career because now you're just visiting back right now right so you were just back in town when i messaged you you were going to be going to minneapolis for some kind of training what was the training in minneapolis and then even this morning you said while i was driving you were training what was was the training look like right now for you yeah so when i was in minneapolis like we were talking earlier about the berkey in yeah. hayward there's a club i'm a part of that's midwest based called team berkey Oh, cool. Um, and they're out of Minneapolis. So I went over there for two weeks just to train um, with the, with some guys and a teammate of mine who's also on the U.S. ski team. Oh, cool. Um, so that was just, just to get out of with here. With the roller skis bit. or what are you, what are yeah. you training? Yeah, roller skiing, running, um, strength. Because May, May is kind of like the start of the new season for us, even though there's no snow. Sure. That's when we start training, like full time for the next winter. Okay. So come like June, I guess it's June 11th today, but like come June 1st, we're like, full-on 
training twice a day every day okay well when is like the what's the season look like when's the first race when's the last race uh first race weekend is end of november first weekend or the oh, last so you're weekend training for a november. long time leading up to it yeah yeah, yeah absolutely okay. and then the last race of the season is generally end of march okay so you do have like a summer but i mean a spring but you do take yeah. a, a couple months off does that yeah. ever set you back or because your girlfriend is a better skier than you does she keep you right in the, with all the health like we got to make sure we're eating the right nutrients at the right hours and doing the whole thing so we don't get behind yeah a little bit of both i think we balance each other out very yeah, well okay. like sure. april is our month where we get to go do whatever whatever we want right you know it's our month to kick back go to a beach like mm -hmm. just leave the training stuff at home leave the everything just behind us do you usually take big like trips in different places in the world kind of a thing during that time frame? yeah yeah like this last april we went to lisbon mm. for like 10 days i've heard incredible things about lisbon portugal yeah which was awesome do you go surfing I did, How or I tried to. I tried to. <laughs> Do you take a lesson? No, we just rented some boards from like some surf guy. Yeah, yeah, twenty sure. bucks. They're everywhere and, on the beach. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. and yeah. it was fun. I mean, we weren't surfing anything crazy big, sure. and more or less just kind of going straight down the wave, not really doing much. Yeah, 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 sure. But uh, it was fun. It was super fun. We yeah. were addicted. Yeah, surfing is I that for sure. Like with skateboarding, I'm in the twilight of my years, which is crazy because I'm 34 and Tony Hawk's like 55 and skates his vert ramp every day. So I'm just like a loser but <laughs> skateboarding is hard on my body yeah you know what i mean so i've been getting into running which i told you which i'm super stoked i just ran my first 10k ever i was oh, just yeah. feeling good and i'm like i'm just gonna keep going and I, yeah so i finally hit that mark and now i really think i need to get into a race where i'm never going to take it seriously like i know that i'm never going to be fast yeah. but to like just to do it in a race like i'm excited about yeah. um but eventually yeah i'll get further so anyway so again back to training so you were in minneapolis training with that group um do they have like designated i gotta think like for the olympics they clearly have designated coaches that I, like i guess the country provides how does that even work for the funding for a lot of that stuff i heard in a different interview that you guys were doing fundraising for the u.s team which blows my mind like yeah. when you think about professional athletes like you don't think about fundraising for the professional athlete team, yeah you know what i mean but yeah, what, how does the funding look like for all this there's a, i think there's a huge misconception in like being a professional athlete and people just assuming you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars right because or even being an olympic athlete you know yeah yeah totally yeah. um so uh yeah with the u.s ski team i mean there are coaches we have i mean they, and there's an awesome facility out in park city utah that's sure. kind of like our home base yeah um but the first two years i was on the team i was on like i guess i'd say the b team and that team wasn't funded, even though I was on the national team. Yeah. There were some things that were included, but I mean, I still needed to fundraise close to 20, 30 grand sure. to support my season. Wow. Um, and a lot of that all came community-based. Sure. Community-based support. Um, People around Minocqua and this whole Yeah, area. exactly. Wow, cool. You know, so the, the community, yeah, the Wisconsin community in general. Sure. I mean, like, because the ski world in Wisconsin, it's, it's deep, it's thick. Like, yeah yeah the berkey's a big cultural thing here yeah so yeah. there was you know i was going all over the state to do kind of fundraisers ski with kids run with kids like just do stuff yeah um, sure. which was super fun and rewarding for myself but um super appreciative to all the support that i got yeah um but yeah there's there's coaching support i mean we have coaches with team berkey as well but i have a you know a personal private coach that i work with sure um who actually lives in norway okay when did you get that coach was that like pre-olympics and everything then no this was actually super recent i got him um, this okay. will be my second year working with him yeah okay cool. just needed to do something different yeah so. well i mean people got it because there's and i guess i'll just go on this quick rant about it people talk about how the wnba is drastically underpaid i'm 100 percent agree with that like totally yeah. way underpaid i'm i'm not trying to say they're not underpaid at all or that they're not overpaid at all they are drastically underpaid um but it is just like the economics behind it and if there isn't media coverage, the only reason professional athletes make money is because of entertainment purposes. Because mm -hmm. people, like, you can sell ad space. You know what I mean? It's entertaining yeah. for people to watch. Everybody watches the Super Bowl. People who don't care about football watch the Super Bowl. Yeah. That's why Super Bowl ads cost so much money. That's why the sponsorship, sponsors pay athletes. And, and, like, that's how that works. So the reason, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons WA, WNBA players make as little as they do is because we don't have a bunch of media coverage and a bunch of people buying tickets and going to games. Yeah. Like, there's just not the interest. Same thing then happens with skiing, right? Well, especially, like, cross-country skiing. I got to yeah, yeah. think of the different disciplines. That's probably one of the 
least covered in the media, right? Yeah, for sure. For yeah. Sure. And yeah. so if they're if you're not in the media, then you can't sell the ad space. Yeah. Sponsors care less. There's just going to be less money in it. So that inherently is a huge problem, which is also then plays into why there's less people that take it seriously. There's less people that get into the sport. There's mm-hmm. less funding than for the courses and for different events and everything. Like all yeah. that stuff is tied. Yeah, I mean generally like like 99.9% of our season all takes place in Europe. Mm-hmm. Just cuz that's where the fan base is. And it wasn't until this last winter we were able to get a World Cup in Minneapolis, actually. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of you know hemming and hawing because you know a lot of Europeans didn't think we had the fan base or we had the media here to do it. Yeah. They, we, they didn't think people cared enough. Sure. But it was awesome because like it was so so huge. Yeah. Like we had eighty to you know a hundred thousand people turn up. Where? F- um, at Worth Park in Minneapolis. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Do you think that's going to be something that then gets renewed? Because there is yeah. like, there's, but there is like a certain amount of novelty, right? Like you look at even the X Games, which is like huge, yeah. right? When that came to Minneapolis, it was a big deal. But then as they had it more years in a row, eventually it was like, well, it's now less of a big deal. Yeah. Do you think that you got to only have it once in a great while for it to have that? Yeah. And that's kind of, yeah, I think the biggest fear is now that we're going to get it again in like two years, yeah. but it's going to be out in, I think, New York in Lake Placid. Oh, okay. Um, but that's going to be the biggest fear is, you know, we hadn't had a World Cup in 20 plus years. Sure. Um, we were supposed to get it, then COVID came, canceled it. So maybe it was so good this time because the hype was just, it was long awaited. Sure. Um, yeah, but there's so much, so many more people on the East Coast, especially yeah. like by New York City that, and especially a lot more people who have money. You would think that that would be I a, hope so. uh, ideally a space. I'm kind of surprised it's not out by Salt Lake. Yeah, I think there's, there's push for that too. Sure. Um, but I, it's, I think it's pretty damn expensive to host. Yeah. Um, so it's just wherever the money is. Sure. Okay. So as a professional athlete now, where does the where your income comes from? Several sources, obviously. But like, generally speaking, how do you make a living out of it? Does some of it come from like being in the Olympics? Do you get paid by the government for that? I don't know how the U.S. team gets paid for that stuff. Like, how do you make money doing it? Yeah. Um, a lot of money just simply comes from personal sponsorships. Okay. Um, trying to brand myself. Which you work with who? Like Quick Trip's one of them, right? Yeah, work with Quick Trip. Okay. Um, Solomon. Solomon cool. is my ski and boot sponsor. Yeah. Um, Hester Gloves. Um, you know, so there's a few personal things that I work with that yeah. get paid. And then uh, in those contracts, there's also result based, um, mm-hmm. like a bonus system. Yeah. So if you ski fast enough and you hit like a 15th, maybe you get more money. Yeah, okay. Um, and it's not to say these contracts are massive and I'm live in large and rolling sure. in cash but yeah um you know that's one way prize money on the world cup so again like if you're top 20 um i think if you're 20th you're, you get like 150 bucks but if you <laughs> okay. win you get like 50 grand yeah okay so sure. there's a spectrum um yeah. for that but you know so if you're if you're consistently racing top 10 yeah you're, you're doing pretty okay yeah sure um Still, that's not like a ton yeah. of money where it's like you can easily retire after no, your career no, even no, being no. a top 10 no and even like Team Berkey, my club team, they there's there's uh, support there, yeah, which is okay. huge. Um, but then there's also this National Nordic Foundation huh. um, that help support athletes, okay. which is super nice. Because without stuff like that, I mean, this sport would it would kind of flicker out. Well, I mean, again, that's part of the problem, right? When you look at the WNBA, it's, it's I'm just pulling them out because they're like yeah, a no, hot it's a good example at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the same thing of like young boys, a lot of them, they're, you know, parents and everyone's behind it. Like, oh, you can make money doing this. You need yeah. to go for it. But a lot of the WNBA players don't make enough money to retire from even. No. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the wages are so low that because it's that's that low, even if you do make it, there's way less support and way less parents and everybody else that are like pushing their girls to go after that. Yeah. And that, again, comes into things with cross-country skiing. Were your parents actually supportive then? Because your brother has his like doctorate, right? He's got a PhD. Yeah. So like... I, I'm speaking from my personal experience. My sister has a PhD and makes way more money than me. Yeah. You know, yeah, but yeah. I do something that like, I, and I'm sure she loves what she yeah. does, but I do something that's more passion based as well. And I definitely don't make the kind of money yeah. that she does. And there's no consistency to what I make, which is kind of similar to you. But yeah. when you were like 18, I'm not going to like take college seriously in the academic side. I'm not saying you didn't, but yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. going after yeah. something that even if I make it, I'm not going to make a whole lot of money. Were yeah. they pretty supportive? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't think I would be where I am today with skiing if I didn't have supportive parents. Right, sure. You know, so um, that was super nice. Yeah. But I, I, that, like, that was nothing that 
something that never really dawned on me really i never really thought about it yeah like oh i'm gonna do this for making millions sure um and i think a really good example is when i first started dating my girlfriend um maya who's a swedish skier yeah like within like the first three weeks i was over there and she wanted some help reading through some of her sponsorship contracts because yeah. they're all in english and like the first couple of weeks of us being together i'm the gentleman you know paying for stuff getting sure. coffee you know paying for lunch and i read through some of her contracts and i was like holy crap like i'm done paying for this stuff seeing what you're pulling in right um so and then she started asking me about it and we started kind of talking about finances mm -hmm. and i was just totally honest with her like we're in the u.s we're not making that much money and right. she looked at me she's like so you you just do this because you love it yeah and i was like yeah 100 percent. yeah 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 i mean it's a different world i opened my skateboard shop knowing i wasn't going to make money yeah there, there isn't money in it but yeah i mean it, it's totally different worlds uh being over there that's a sport that's taken seriously you know yeah, what i mean yeah, and yeah. here it isn't a, a sport that's taken seriously yeah. i don't know anybody that i mean you're the first person I know that does anything related to it professionally. Yeah. You know what I mean? And not not even that like I know personally, but that I've ever even heard of. Yeah. It's just that limited. Obviously you do it because you you care about it and it's never been about the money. Uh at what point were you making enough money that it like was a career? Was it when you got cuz it wasn't when you first got asked to be on the national team then, right? No, 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 no. And I mean even now it's kind of hard to say it's like a career. Oh, I mean sure. it definitely is. Um and there's I'm able to make it work, which uh -huh. is awesome. Um, but I, within the last two or three years, I think kind of post Olympic year. Yeah, sure. Um, cause I think in the U S like, like you were saying, the sport, no one really knows it. Right. And that's fair. I think a lot of us realize that in the sport, but once you can start adding Olympic skier mm -hmm. to that resume, then I think it grabs people's attention. Just yeah. the word Olympic. Sure. You know, it means so much more. I think it's a powerful word. Yeah, I think in the yeah. US. well, and, and talking about sponsorship dollars, but again, that's kind of the, the difficult thing is, right? Your sponsors will pay you based on somewhat like you'll get bonuses on how well you do in the race. But let's be honest, what they care about more is people seeing their brand, yeah. like realistically, yeah. in which case that's where social media is so big for so many people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of athletes that make way more money from the, their contracts just based on what they get for social media than they do from anything else that they do. Yeah, you know what sure. I mean? And yeah. like... It, your like your Instagram, I don't remember what the numbers are, but for being an Olympian, because again, it's based on what the kind of sport it is. It's not like you're a huge influencer. Yeah. So even if you have contracts with Solomon and all these other brands, it's not like they're going to pay out crazy because it's not necessarily going to reach a, a whole bunch of people. But as you get older, you know, and you're talking about with your girlfriend, you start looking at finances. At some point, you do realize that even if you're going to competitively ski at a high level for let's say 10 more years, which might be a stretch. That's hard to do that in your forties. Right. I would think. Yeah. I mean, I'd say right now at this point, I'm thinking like two more, maybe. Okay. So <laughs> if you were, you start to think at the yeah. end of it, like, okay, so where is this going to transition? Like, what am I realistically going to do? Cause at some point, like I want to own a house or you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I would love to own a house like this on a lake in right. this time, you know, I mean, I would love to be able to do this. Right. Yeah. Right. So then how, what's the strategy? How, where are you going to go? What are you thinking right now? You have to still be lasered in because are you gonna, are you trying to go in the next Olympics? We'll see. I, uh, I mean, it's, it's on qualify. the horizon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. We'll take it year by year. Yeah, sure. But I mean, so right now you're still fully laser focused in on that, but it's gotta be in the back of your mind of like, okay, so what am I building towards after? Yeah, and that's the million dollar question. Like, if I had a dollar for every time I got asked, right. what, what are you going to do when you're done skiing? Yeah. I wouldn't have to think about it because sure. I would be rich already. Right. Um, and the thing is, I, I have no idea what I want to do. Um, I think you said it kind of earlier, but like with academics and school, like, you know, I went to the University of Utah and I studied exercise science for about two and a half years because mm -hmm. that was awesome. I loved it. I mean, it, it, it mirrored skiing so well yeah. um, in athletics. You know, you learn about the body and then you can kind of incorporate it into skiing. But then all of a sudden that started to get really hard to balance what I wanted to do with skiing and what I wanted to do with academics. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it. I'm like, well, if I want to go back to school, I can go back to school. Yeah. It's school's always there. Skiing is going to be such a short part of my life. And I want to squeeze out every ounce I can. So I switched my major. I studied sociology, which was awesome. I enjoyed it quite mm -hmm. a lot. But it's one of those things, well, when I'm done skiing, I have a sociology degree. What am I going to do with it? Right. And I, I don't really know. I have no idea. But I've learned so much about myself and skiing and the body and health, nut you know, nutrition, just 
mental health, like so much in this sport that I would love to be able to stay in it in yeah. some capacity, whether it's coaching or, um, you know, with the, the U S ski team somehow in capacity, I'm not sure. Sure. But, but I mean, even if you just worked with a brand, even if yeah. you were somewhat involved in sales, not necessarily calling store to store type thing, but like in the marketing of it in team management type stuff, like that happens within skateboarding a lot because of, I guess I always pull parallels to that. Cause that was like the industry yeah. I've yeah. been in, you know what I mean? But like you, that's the problem with professional athletes. If you don't make enough money to just like live off it the rest of your life, which is pretty hard with cross country skiing. It's like, you don't have anything of value to people like intrinsically because you don't have a, like what is being a pro skier? How does that translate to like any other job? Really? It yeah. doesn't mean you know how to do accounting. It doesn't mean you know how to sell a house. It doesn't mean you know how to be a HR person or whatever, but if you can be in the industry in some capacity, you yeah. have to get creative. Yeah. But I think there's even more jobs and more opportunity into in, in that realm. It's just never going to be, I mean, you're not living the life of luxury anyways, right no. now, but it's not in the limelight, yeah. but there's more jobs in it, right? There's um, like pros that'll go work for Vans corporate after they're done being a pro skateboarder or whatever. Yeah. And it's just, there's more stable income with yeah. all that, all that type of stuff. Is your girlfriend kind of on the same page of like how far, how long she wants her career to be? Is it going to be a similar time frame? I think so. Um, she's just a year younger than I am. Um, and like I said earlier, like she's, she's a badass. Yeah. She does what I pretend to do. <laughs> she, she can, she probably could retire okay. and be totally fine. Sure. Um, maybe not quite, but, uh, I think so. I think she's looking at maybe the next Olympics, but also after the Olympics in Italy, which will be the next winter Olympics. Um, there's a world championships in her hometown where she grew up. Oh, so she, that's, she's got it. I think she's kind of looking at that and hoping. Yeah. Sure. But, uh, you never know. That would be a hell of a way to go out, though, right? Yeah. Win be, that one? It would be <laughs> It would be badass. Yeah. Okay. So where, what are you guys talking about as far as, like, living situation? you have any, any ideas if you guys want to have a family and stuff over there somewhere or maybe here? Or, like, what are you guys thinking? Yeah. I mean, why, why at least where we're skiing, yeah. since 95% of our season takes place in Europe, yeah. makes sense to try to be over there as much as we can. Right. Um, but she's been here a few times and she loves it. Which what was is her awesome. favorite thing about being in Wisconsin? She come to Wisconsin? Yeah, yeah. She's came here um, the winter after the spring after the Olympics. Did she have fried cheese curds or was that not in the, the Oh diet? yeah. We we did it all. We did it <laughs> oh, all. We cool. got the cheese curds. We yeah. got uh, she had she had some spotted cow. Mm. She uh, went to Quick Trip. Hell she yeah. Uh, yeah, she did I we did it all. But I think cool. her favorite thing, mm -hmm. which blows my mind is she saw school buses they don't have school buses no they don't have big yellow school buses oh <laughs> i've never considered that <laughs> and it, it blew my i did some interview yeah, with sure. a local news channel and i was like she went out and just walked around and i was like hopefully she'll find something to do and i saw her afterwards i'm like so how was it yeah and like she looked at me just like so excited excited in her face i saw a school bus i saw a fire hydrant <laughs> and i walked on a sidewalk and I was like, whoa, 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 what? Yeah, sure. <laughs> what do you mean sidewalk? And she's like, you know, like the house and a street and the sidewalk. It's like, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, it was like, it was like I was in a TV show. <laughs> and I was just like dying laughing. It was yeah. so funny. But I mean, I guess that's like as us as kids and we think of the yellow taxi. Like, you yeah, gotta, you yeah. gotta hail down a taxi in New York City, right? Yeah. You know, because we've seen it in like every movie. Or yeah, exactly. The kind yeah, of wave yeah, yeah. Whistle. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so you're you're in training mode now. Approximately how many races do you think you're going to do this year? Is it already set in front of you? And then I think feel like one of the hardest parts would be the fact that every race is so drastically different because each location is different. So the length isn't even the same, right? But then the elevation, like there's just a lot of different things that go on with it. Yeah, so race-wise, I mean, I could race anywhere from 15 to 25 times. It's not set in stone. Um, it just depends how I'm doing. I mean, if I'm qualifying for the next races, oh, okay. or if the shape's good, if I'm sick, if I'm health, you know, healthy yeah, or sick. Yeah, okay. But yeah, I, I think roughly around 20, Is I would say. Is that like every weekend, pretty much? Pretty much from, yeah, the end of November until March. Okay. With a few weekends off. You know, Christmas is off and... Sure. But then there's also condensed race schedules where it's kind of like the Tour de France. Yeah. You know, or we'll have the Tour de Ski, <clears throat> Tour de Ski which okay. is seven days of racing with one day off. So you oh. kind of have either weekends or condensed races. Sure. Um, but I'm primarily only a sprinter. So even though there might be two, you know, there's two, maybe three races a weekend, like a Friday to Sunday, one of those days is only sprinting. Yeah, okay. Um, which is how far? 
in kilometers since skiing is all kilometer based right. um it's like 1.2 to 1.4 so it roughly mm. takes anywhere from two minutes 40 seconds to maybe three minutes okay um per per race yeah sure and the way a sprint works is you know you take 80 people who want to do the race and everyone goes individually and does a lap on the course right so they're 15 seconds apart yeah okay um, sure and then the 30 fastest times qualify for the heats okay and there's a quarterfinal a semifinal, and a final how much time in between each after the qualifier you have about two hours oh, okay so you have time to get some food relax you we usually get like a massage yeah. flush the legs out um because i mean it's it's like two and a half minutes of just max just right. max yeah, effort totally so then uh hopefully you make top 30 qualify for the heats and then in the heats it's six heats of five and lucky the first two automatically qualify okay to the semifinal, and then there's two lucky losers oh right because the time wise they would have yeah exactly yeah okay and then there's two semifinals, and then the final sure um so i mean if you're racing to the final every weekend i mean you're racing quite a lot yeah so i guess you could break that down and say you race four times in one day yeah okay. but i guess i would look at it just one one race is there a lot of strategy then or do you notice with people where they really put more effort into certain races versus others because like their body just can't go 100 percent on all of them yeah but also i mean there's some of like the top guys who are you know winning crystal globes at the end of the year they're winning almost every weekend okay sure. every race um yeah but for sure i mean there's definitely uh people focus maybe more heavily on the whole season mm -hmm. and maybe some people focus more heavily on certain weekends so the guys that win every single race versus you which you do very well i'm not trying to downplay no, it, no. <laughs> but what do you what do you think are the main differences as to why is it their training regimen is is different than yours is it i mean there's got to be some reason yeah i think i i don't know i mean a lot of the guys who are having success are Norwegians, Swedes, you know, where culturally this mm -hmm. like that is embedded in their blood. Right. Like they're sure. just, that's just what they do. Yeah. So I think historically there's just a lot more research and culturally just like, they're just better at it. Well, they've been doing it since way younger. Yeah. So I gotta think that experience. They have a lot of knowledge yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the Americans, like we're all starting to catch up a little bit, but mm -hmm. what makes skiing is so fun. It's just so unique. Like just because you know a teammate of mine is winning and if i do exactly what he's doing it's not going to correlate to me winning right you know like what he does isn't going to work for me right so it's just kind of trying to crack your code right yeah to everybody's out, body's different yeah right? to figure yeah. out what's what's going to work for you is there like a certain like body type that's typical with skiers like are all skiers tall like you is that a normal thing not really it's kind of a big spectrum yeah okay. i mean height wise spectrum not I mean, yeah 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 of course <laughs> like yeah everyone's going to be very thin yeah you know yeah. what i mean you can't exactly carry around a lot of body fat is there like a percentage of body fat that most people have i gotta think it's gotta be super low <laughs> it definitely is low and i think like even but you don't like shoot for that with a dietitian or anything no not really okay. i mean i think in any sport there's and i think skiing specifically there are cases of you know eating disorder and stuff like that because yeah, there's sure. some people who might think the skinnier you are skinnier you are the faster you're going to ski yeah, you need muscle yeah but there is yeah so but for the most part i mean you look at some of the girls who are racing like they're they're jacked yeah like, sure could kick my ass sure but sure. it takes more because it does take more upper body strength i imagine the people realize right yeah for sure and that's the fun thing about skiing it's full body i mean right yeah. legs core upper body you're sure. doing it all well and it's something you can do literally the rest of your life i imagine that yeah. even when you're done doing it competitively you'll still just want to do it yeah exactly. it might only get funner then <laughs> because you don't have the pressure on it maybe yeah i mean i hope so i hope it's a lifelong sport i mean my dad still does it my mom still does it and sure. they, they love getting out so let's talk about the olympics because that's obviously like that's got to be the peak of of the sport right i gotta imagine yeah how did you how did it come to be that you were on the olympic team like how you qualify through world cup races or something you get a phone call one day like oh you made it do you know going into the last race of the season if i place this i'm in how does that work um so pretty much the spring before the olympics okay. um the u.s ski team sits down and builds criteria so and they set the benchmarks of how they're going to pick the team so when you start your season, you know what you need to do to make the team. You know you need to be ranked top 40 or top 30 in 
some discipline, um, which is nice because then you you know what you have to do. And it's it's also nice because some sports they just have like um, I think like swimming and stuff. They have like Olympic trials. Like you have one week to make that team. You have that one opportunity to make the team. Right. And if you're sick that week or something goes wrong, like sure. it's all down the drain. Where we have you know from November end of November until I think the team was picked sometime in January. Hmm. You know, so we have, we have, like, you know, if I have a bad race, I have time to bounce back from it. Um, which was nice because I didn't have the results I needed kind of later into the year for, to meet that criteria. Hmm. But once you have that race and you're like, oh, I'm going to meet the criteria. It's like, sweet, I'm good. Um, but it wasn't like the big, get a phone call right. type deal. It was kind of, you kind of, you just knew. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then leading up to the games we went to a pre-olympic camp at altitude uh, which was where in lavinio in italy oh even the u.s team did yeah just the cross-country team did yeah did we it, all, from all the different countries they all go sweden was actually there as well but uh going up to the games people just have different philosophies you know should you go to altitude and try to like boost red blood cells in your body sure. to get a boost for that because and also beijing was high altitude right. so you're trying to adapt your body a little bit to it yeah okay. um but we were there the team sweden was there um but yeah go, once you kind of got invited to that camp because you knew that that camp was the pre-olympic camp you, you kind of knew you were going to go to the games oh okay so do you get like an official letter or anything at, at some point that you had to like frame and put in your house yeah i think <laughs> i got an email if i remember i think i think that's what it was no, like you're supposed letter. to get a hard copy <laughs> yeah so, something i can hang on the wall next to my diplomas dude i was uh, the show is featured on the front page of thrasher's website like thrashermagazine.com biggest yeah. thing is skateboarding not like in the hard mag so yeah i just have a screenshot of when that yeah. happened but it's still like legendary well i mean <laughs> i have like everything that i got from the games right i've saved everything yeah your track suits and all the things yeah i mean race suits swag like every covid test i had to take just yeah, to get so let's to talk the about games because you went to the games that was during the covid year right yeah, so yeah. Th were there other athletes that should have competed that or i shouldn't say should have but would have otherwise that weren't there what was the difference besides being tested all the time you guys kind of had to like totally quarantine while yeah. you're doing it. like it was a very different experience of the olympics yeah it was it that was probably the most stressful part it was like sweet i qualified for the olympics but the olympics are a month away now i just can't catch covid yeah. Um, cause we, when we went to Lavinio in Italy, it was a bubble. Like, like I said, my girlfriend's Swedish. She went to the Olympics. She was in Lavinio. I mean, I could, we, I could see her, but six feet apart, you know, like I was, oh. we were not going to risk anything. Right. Yeah. You know, okay. odds are we would have been fine, but I'm like, we're not risking anything. Well, like, yeah. Your whole life has built up to like yeah. the Olympics are the peak. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, but it, it, I mean, it was damn stressful. We had, uh, we were COVID testing every single day. Um, and then there was a 96 hour. Because there was the antigen test and then the PCR test. Yeah. And we were doing like antigen tests every day. And those were 50-50. Yeah, okay. But the PCR test was like, that was like the, you had to pass those. Yeah. And we had a 96 hour and then like a 72 hour or even 24 hour test. And those were like, those were the focus. Like those testing facilities were selected by the Chinese. Yeah, okay. Like that's, they were only going to accept those results. Right. Um, so that was stressful. Um, but at the end of the day, for me, like the whole COVID thing was just kind of like, if you get it, you get it. Right. Like sure. why stress over it? You're just going to yeah. be wasting energy and it's like, whatever. But you didn't get it, right? I didn't. Um, but my <laughs> girlfriend had a false positive, which oh. it was her last kind of antigen test before her 96 hour test. Uh -huh. um, and I was using the bathroom and she called me and I was like, oh, I'll pick up the phone, whatever, FaceTime and thought it'd be fun funny sitting on the toilet but uh she was just bawling and i was yeah. just like pitting my stomach like oh my god what yeah and she's like oh i have, my, I have two lines i'm positive like i don't know what i'm gonna do and just like the world is crumbling right um but then her pcr test came back and she was fine man that's so, awful <laughs> i got yeah. uh i went to croatia during the pandemic by myself and then i tested positive at the airport when i was trying to come home and they just like pulled me to the side, sat me in a little metal chair in this gravel parking lot until the Red Cross came up in an armored van and like pushed me in the back to yeah. go. It was 
it was a nightmare, but I can't imagine working my whole life towards something and then having that potentially ripped away. So let's talk about the, the, the Olympics from there though. I mean, it must've still been like a pretty magical experience to be in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even though people weren't allowed to attend. Right. Yeah. There, I mean, there was, there was Chinese spectators. There were some. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like my parents probably would have loved to come. I, yeah. I would assume so. Yeah. 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 yeah sure. Um, Did you rate, like, were you happy? I, don't, I guess I don't know the full results of it, um, but like, I guess, what were the results of it? Do you feel good about the whole thing? Do you, obviously you, I'm sure you always replay in your mind. I could have done this better. Could have done that better. But. Yeah. Yeah. With every race, you can always replay it. And, right. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, it was, it was sweet. I mean, um, I, I'm happy with how I performed. I mean, of course you want to walk away with a medal. Right. Um, but, but there's how many people that were in the race total? Um, were there's there like probably 80, like, like 50, 60. Right. So top three would be real difficult. What did yeah. you place? Um, I finished the day 15th, which was... That's pretty good. Um, yeah. I was psyched. I mean, okay. like, yeah, I, I go back and replay things in my head, wishing I would have maybe sure. done things differently. But also, I think I did exactly what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just the way it is. Um, sure. It sucked because the wax tech that I work with, he actually tested positive on his COVID test before he came over. So I wasn't able to like work with the guy I worked with all winter Yeah, okay. Um, who helps me select skis and blah, blah, blah. So maybe that, did that have some factor into it? I have no idea, sure. but I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, right. And then I was selected to race on the relay team, which we finished eighth or ninth, which was the best result by the U S um, and like, since like Salt Lake. Wow. Olympics. So cool. that was, that was cool. Yeah. That definitely was like rewarding for sure. Dope. Um, but spectator wise, it, yeah, there's Chinese there. Sure. Um, my parents would have loved to come, but. But they're going to have another opportunity. Hopefully. 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 That's the plan. But yeah. Team USA did a really cool, like, um, watch, like a watch party out in Park City. Yeah. Okay. For, cool. um, so that was cool. So they went out there and did that. And oh, okay. I think as I was racing, like they kind of did like a split screen, like my parents, me racing, which was kind of cool. I thought, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But so I think, I think they had a good time. Yeah. All things considering. Cool. Um, yeah. We have yeah. a lot of music festivals in the area. Like we got one that I'm a part of called reverb music festival. Um, this is the second year of it. It's in, it's in Eau Claire. Same Sweet. people who own country jam yeah. throw this festival. Oh, yeah. Um, last year it was like emo and pop punk music. I was backstage and I interviewed, uh, the singer of the plain white tees. I interviewed Charlotte Sands and red jumpsuit apparatus and like all these bands yeah. and stuff. And I created their mascot for them, which is what's on my laptop here, this like little character. Oh, All my yeah. artwork's kind of like that. Yeah. Um, but this year is two days. Uh, it's Friday, Saturday, August 16th and 17th. And the Friday, it's all rappers from when I was growing up, which were similar age. So like, yeah. there it's like, uh, T.I.'s the headliner. Yeah. Um, but then there's Young Jock, Mike Jones, Twista, Trick Daddy. There's like, I'm stoked. That'll be really dude. fun. I'm so excited. Yeah. I, I made a um, like kind of a meme post about Mike Jones promoting the festival and his opener followed me on Instagram after that. Yeah. And then I was talking with him and he wants to do an interview. I think I have an in, I think Sliding I'm going to be able in. to get Mike Jones on yeah. the show. Even there's if it's a, for five minutes. There's a really cool saying in Swedish. I don't know what it is in Swedish, but it's in English. It's sliding in on a shrimp sandwich. <laughs> and it's kind of that exact same thing. Like you just get your foot in the door. You just like, it just kind of happens. Yeah, sure. So that's sweet. Which is what happened with you being over in uh, Norway, right? You got to like start skiing with all of the superstars of the sport. I'm sure that yeah, helps yeah. with like the progression, right? Because like when you're the best of everybody that's around you, it's hard to keep progressing because you don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah, There's nobody yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah, inspiring yeah. you to keep yeah. being better, yeah. but it sucks to lose, especially when you're a competitive person. So if you're around people who are better than you, like that naturally Makes elevates you. you better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Who are you training with these days out there? Um, or I guess, who are the guys that you look up to that you train with? Yeah. Well, I mean, when I was going over there, I was lucky enough. My brother was studying over there, got mm -hmm. his doctorate. So, and he was studying some of the top Norwegian guys at the time and lived in this apartment building with um, a skier named Nicholas Deerhog, okay. who is, you know, Nor one of Norway's, you know, all time skiers. Wow. Um, and he asked him like, Hey, I have a little brother who's a skier. Like, could he come over and train with you? And he was like, <laughs> sure. Yeah. So sure. I just, yeah, I, I went over one summer, like after my freshman year of college and trained with him and another skier, Diedrich Tonseth, yeah. um, who are now two of my just really good friends. Sure. Um, Nicholas has since retired, but Diedrich's still skiing. So I'll be able to ski train with him this summer, a bunch, which will be awesome. Yeah. Um, and I, I would ultimately say, you know, like Nick Loss and both Diedrich are like two of my biggest, you know, role models in the sport. Yeah. You know, they, they, to be like two of the world's best skiers 
and just kind of take this random American 22 year old under their wing a little bit and just teach me so much was, was awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, when you're in, I, even for them, obviously they're more superstars over there, but yeah. still it's like a, a relatively small community of people that are like really into it. Yeah. So I feel like it's just kind of like a natural thing of you see this like bright eyed poppy dog of like, you, you just like, you want to help. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like I see that with this, the younger kids that skate and stuff that come through my shop. Not that I was ever pro skateboarder, but you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I see them and I'm like all excited to like tell them and teach them like, yeah. no, this is really what skateboarding is all about. Yeah. Like that, that's rad that you were able to find role models like that. And I think that was kind of necessary for you to leave the States to be able to put yourself in a position like that to, to really succeed at the level that you're at. No, hundred percent. And it's like, it's cool. The culture in the U S it's shifting a little bit. So mm -hmm. like there's more skiers doing that. But also now that we're getting better as a nation, like it's fun for me to be able to come back here. And like now when I was in Minneapolis, there's a bunch of college kids kids and juniors who are there training and I get to share that some of that knowledge with them. Yeah. Um, so well, that, it that's that is possible for them. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's a big part of it is not understand. Like if you don't see somebody that you can feel you can relate to in any way doing it, then you think it's out of reach. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's part of what the show is about is like talking to people. So that way everyone realizes, cause you're well aware people are just people. Like yeah. they all have this very similar faults just cause you're good at skiing. Doesn't make you any better at chess. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like you're really good at this thing, but everything else, you're just a regular human. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And yeah, even yeah. with what you do, you're a regular human that just has put more energy into that than everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's like, it, not that it sucks, but like, yeah, people are like, Oh, you're the skier. Mm -hmm. And it's, I am like, I, that is who I am. I, sure. I guess I would identify as a skier, yeah, a professional a skier, yeah. but there's so much more to right. me, you know, like love coming home to the Midwest, mm -hmm. love water skiing. Love being out and like going to the boundary waters. Um, love camp, like all that stuff, you know? But yeah, I am a skier. Right. But there's so much more. And even the world's best skiers or best skateboarders or mm -hmm. they might be the best at something, but they're still genuinely, genuinely really good just people. Totally. You know? Yeah. They're, well, not, they're think, not generally assholes or anything I think like it's that, really but. hard to get to a point of success if you're an asshole. Yeah. I used to think the opposite. Like, I just, I don't know why. I just had that in my mind. But as I've met more successful people, almost all of them are cool. And part yeah. of it is because if they weren't nice, people wouldn't work with them. Yeah. And they wouldn't have ever gotten to the place because you can't do it alone. Like, no. you really have to have people that want to support you and care about you and help you. Like you said, with those other skiers that you were with. Yeah. If you came in and you were just this cocky kid... They wouldn't have taught you things. They wouldn't have wanted no. to take you under their wing. Like, so generally speaking, successful people usually, not always, but usually are pretty cool people, I think. Yeah. So no, let's I talk agree. about the next Olympics. So what? It, when is the next Olympics and what do you need to do to be able to get there and then beat your 15th place? Uh, next Olympics is, what was it, in two winters? So not this winter, but the following winter um, in Italy, Milano. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll be all spread out in Italy, um, which will be cool. Apparently, this games is not typical. In awesome. terms of there's not going to be like, usually most Olympics, they build these huge villages all <laughs> over like cool types of things. And yeah, sure. then the Olympics finishes and these villages just crumble and never see the light of day again. Okay. Um, whereas in this one, I think they're, it's going to be more laid back and like teams staying in hotels and stuff. So maybe that'll take away from the experience. I don't know. But uh, I think that'll be really cool. But yeah. I just got to keep racing fast. I mean, there's in, in the U.S., there's a lot of really fast young kids coming up. Mm -hmm. Like on the U.S. ski team now, I'm the oldest guy. Oh, okay. Everyone else is 22, 23, 24. Oh, you're by a ways then. Yeah, yeah exactly. So okay. it's keeping me on my toes for sure. Yeah. So, But as long as I'm skiing fast and I'm having fun and enjoying it, like absolutely I'm going all in. Yeah. Um, which I'm psyched about. So Yeah. Well, experience does play a part. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like uh, when you talk about like playing back races and going, oh, I wish I would have done that, or I would have done that. Like those are things that are important that you learn, and then in the future you don't make those same mistakes. It's Try not, not just about yeah. like the raw power of your body. The experience does make a big difference because yeah. those kids could be faster on the best day, but they have a lot of off days. Oh you know yeah, I mean, I mean there's... And that's not saying that you're praying for the off day, but it's just like, yeah. it's much more likely that things will happen. Like you definitely, you have an advantage having the experience. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's being fast, especially like when you're sprinting and you're in a heat of six guys. Right. You know, putting yourself in the right situation at the right time to mm -hmm. make the best move. Right. You know, not saying I always do that. Sure. But it helps to have yeah. some experience under the belt. But um, it is, it, it's, it's fun having such a young team. Yeah. But also it sucks because I feel like younger kids these days, they just have a 
language of their own with these slang words and stuff and <laughs> they get going and i'm like what are you guys talking about right now <laughs> yeah yeah but i mean that's everything right that's yeah. even coming back to like social media like we were talking about where we we're talking about finances of like some people they build enough of a social media following across the whatever platforms and stuff like you had done a vlog briefly uh mm -hmm. with your girlfriend that maybe you'll, you'll hop back into when you have more time but like you don't have a huge social media following you're not in a position necessarily to just like take over and go that route promoting brands directly after yeah. these young kids understand how that stuff works a lot better because it was ingrained into their lives yeah you know what i mean like you're young enough i'm a little bit older than you but even so social media wasn't part of the social hierarchy when we were kids yeah right oh, yeah. that became a thing after that nowadays like kids will only date within certain follower counts and stuff it's weird because i've heard about it in my shop yeah. from kids where i'm like what yeah. they're like yeah he can't hang out with her she's got way more followers and i'm like whoa social setting which yeah, is it's crazy horrible yeah. um but you see why they like so many kids get good at it because it's so important to the success of their lives socially and everything yeah. else and it really does like play more into financials and everything nowadays too yeah. people hire people for other things not just influencers but will get hired for things more frequently just based on that because they know that they'll get more eyes on whatever it is that they're doing yeah so no, i believe it that's what you gotta do is you gotta make Make this vlog really take off yeah you guys exactly gotta be the cross-country ski vloggers it try i mean there's actually a few out there who are doing it and they're doing pretty well sure but it's it's a niche thing mm -hmm. but it's it's like just like you're saying like when we were growing up we didn't have the social media i mean instagram was fresh and kind of new as we were getting older but like yeah I, there was nothing else to i mean you didn't care about that stuff so you're outside right. doing stuff like you were skating you know mm -hmm. i was outside playing in the woods like but nowadays it's just you don't, you don't quite have that no, no. For like me, it was just generation. a necessity thing. Yeah. It was like I opened my store and it was like, well, this is like for a physical business, you have to have an online pre presence, even yeah. if you're not selling online. Yeah. So that's the only reason I got social media. Yeah. And then with the show, that's the only way people see it. Yeah. Not that many people are going to, I'm, I'm well aware, not that many people are going to watch this entire interview. No, I mean, yeah. But a lot of people will see the random clips from it. Yeah. yeah and the yeah. only reason they're going to see the random clips from it is because I've worked on the social media side of it. It's yeah. just like a necessary evil. Well, you can look at it as a necessary evil or a huge area of opportunity, like for success, yeah. however you want to look at it. But that is like a big thing that the younger kids really have a hold on. Like be, they know how to brand and market themselves outside yeah. of results of a race. And yeah. I think that stuff matters quite a bit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I could have tons of gold medals. Right. but have no social media presence and maybe no one would know who I am. Yeah, for real though. You know, which is yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah. Let me give you one gift before we get to the end of the show. I, are you allowed to eat chocolate? Yeah, I'm a seafood kind of guy. Just eat, see it and I eat it. <laughs> I have like no dietary restrictions. <laughs> That's dope. Okay, I have this one for you. Sweet. Have you ever heard of my own? I haven't. They're from Spooner, Wisconsin. Oh, really? Yeah. And they I drive like, through there quite a lot. Yeah. They market themselves as the best chocolate in the country, and they are by far the best chocolate I've ever had. It's really? like crazy, crazy good. Yeah. It's super, super oh, good. Sure. But yeah, their um, their factory is actually, like the chocolate factory is in Spooner. Nice. Yeah. So they thankfully gave me some that I could give some guests. So That'd you can go awesome. to mayanachocolate.com and use the promo code PASSION for 25% off if you want to get some for yourself. Um, maybe for Father's Day, right? That's coming up. You can hook up your dad with some It's some coming goodies. up quick. Yeah, you owe him after you got to stay here for a little bit. While yeah, you were, uh, both my mom and training. dad. Yeah. And the best part was they, they took off for two weeks, um, like mid-May, to go oh. visit my brother in Norway. So I was just here by myself. Oh, whoa. You know what I mean? You just living in your parents' house by yourself. That's living large. Dude, this is like the best Airbnb. Like this, this would cost a lot <laughs> if they Airbnb'd this. <laughs> if I had to pay rent here, I don't think I'd be here. <laughs> yeah this place is dope so yeah cool well we're getting to the end of the episode i always like to ask the same question because i think when you do something that you're passionate about for a living you get to have really unique experiences which make it worth not making money you know ideally you do make money you know and get all these huge sponsorships and maybe they're still coming let's we'll cross our fingers but that's not why you do it so can you share a story of unique experience you're really grateful for but it only happened because you pursued skiing yeah um it was actually last winter um during a ski race tour to ski we were in northern italy in toblock and my mom my dad my little sister my brother my sister-in-law my older sister wasn't able to come which sucked but it still made it really unique for me that i was able to have my whole family in another country watching me do what i love to do and it kind of felt like this full circle moment where they have supported me so much and I've said no to so many things to do with the family, um, to have everyone there together 
it was just a really i don't know just a special moment for me yeah um it didn't i didn't race my best but just like knowing that they were there at the finish line um it was just really cool yeah um, and even my dad said the same thing he's like if you would have asked me 30 years ago you could you see yourself going to europe to watch a ski race or anything he'd you know he would say no right um so it's just that that was like a really really special moment i would say you don't very few people from wisconsin have ever been to italy yeah yeah i mean <laughs> i mean even like or europe at, for that just matter. traveling i mean i know you right. said earlier like maybe don't use traveling as an example but like when i first went to europe to to train like i was 22 and my dad was just like oh i'm you know 55 and i've never left the country yet yeah you know it's just you put it in a puts it in perspective a little bit right which uh, makes it really special yeah yeah i would say so i think i read a stat one time and it was like 60 percent of americans don't leave the country not even to like mexico or canada they just don't leave the country their whole life which was hard for me to believe but like no, I think that's true. Yeah. Most people don't. But once you like <laughs> break that seal, <laughs> I yeah, feel yeah. like it becomes, it's because again, you don't necessarily know that it's possible because you haven't known people around you that do it. But I'm sure even just your brother going over there to yeah. live, like open the door quite a bit of like, oh, so we can, that, like, that's something we can just do. Yeah. Like, cool. You know what I mean? And then once you get in the racing circuit and you're kind of forced anyways to go, yeah. then it's like, okay, well, yeah, we could literally go anywhere we want. Yeah. And it's, ridiculous how actually easy it is it's way easier than people think and it's cheaper yeah. than people think yeah if like, you plan it right it's not bad at all no you can stay and not that everyone needs to stay in hostels but like no really i've spent more money going to florida for a week yeah than i have going to europe for two yeah oh, because, i mean i'll find domestic flights way more expensive than international sometimes totally and you're just like hmm, well and what you're going to do when you're traveling internationally like you know i went yeah. to japan for a few weeks it was like, I'm eating $5 ramen, yeah. you know, because that's what I want is yeah. like the little street food. And I'm going to see like the temples and like doing all these things that are like really cheap. Yeah. You know, because in the, the dollar like, exchange and everything, it's not that expensive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and in general, like they're historical things versus yeah. like in America, you're going to go to Disney World or whatever. Like you're just going to go throw so much money and then you're going to go out to eat every night because it's yeah. like, oh, I'm on vacation. I got to like live it up. You can traveling is so much more like available to people than it ever has been before, and it's it's much easier to do than than everybody thinks. Whereas if you got to live in a different country, that uh, well, I guess you already do live in another country. Let's say this: it, what's the next country that's high on your list that you want to go to? Actually, Japan. Japan's the I yeah. still I've been to I think eleven countries now. Still my favorite place I've been to. Yeah, we when we were this Easter, we were out um, skiing in Norway and. Some of our friends, we all ask each other, like, what's our, like, our favorite places to go? And then each year we're going to try to go there. Yeah. Um, in Lisbon, Portugal was Maya's, my girlfriend. So we went there. That was, little did she know it was a surprise trip. Like, we had already planned it. She's like, oh, oh I really cool. want to go here. And we're like, oh, sweet. We're taking her there. Yeah, nice. But uh, a few of us all said Japan. Yeah. Like, we all want to go to Japan. Or maybe even, like, South Africa or something. Sure, sure. It would be really cool. Would you go to Nagano, like, up north to ski? Or would you want to go to Tokyo? And- I have no idea. I, that's the cool thing is, I guess in my head right now, I said, I want to go I just want to go to Japan. Sure. My little sister's been there for skiing, yeah. um, alpine skiing. Um, but I don't know. It's just the culture seems so sick. Everything about it is incredible, especially yeah. being an American where we don't have anything older than 100 years old. No, exactly. You know what I mean? They yeah. got wooden buildings that are 2,000 years old. There, yeah. And they're like free to go to. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's incredible. Well, okay. I'll, I'll get out of your hair because you're visiting family. Um, thank you so much for having me at this Thanks for driving spot. up here. Yeah, this was really cool, yeah. man. I never, I guess I never really imagined I'd be sitting with an Olympian in northern Wisconsin, but this is pretty dope. I'm yeah, glad that this worked it. out. Yeah, no, this was dope. Now I just got to drive all the way back. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks. No, <I'm> just <laughs> thanks to Quick Trip for helping me out with my gas. Yeah, yes. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.